Hi, this is Dr. A with a clinical chemistry review video. We're going to look at tumor markers uh, testing methods. So let's look at some lab considerations for testing for tumor markers. So uh, again, the lack of standardization makes comparison of serial patient results using different assay really treacherous. Very difficult, uh, as I stated in the intro video, um, you have to compare apples to apples. So you can only compare uh, serial results from the same analyzer with the same methodology. There are differences in antibody specificity, amylate heterogeneity, assay design, there's a lack of standard reference material, calibration, kinetics, and there's variation in reference ranges and all of that. So uh, because tumor markers can vary widely between reagent slot, this is particularly a concern when you um, use polyclonal antibodies as reagents. Tumor markers often vary in concentration by orders of magnitude, making an accurate measure, measurement challenging compared with your routine chemistry analytes. So they can go from just a little bit of tumor markers to a lot of tumor markers at really high levels. Um, so let's talk immunoassays. So that is the most commonly used method to measure tumor markers. They have many advantages, including the ability to be automated easily. There are some factors in interpreting the tumor marker immunoassays. So there's the linearity, the hook effect, and heterophile antibodies. All of these need to be considered. So linearity, uh, it is determined by analyzing and replicates the specimens spanning the reportable range. So from really, really low levels to the highest levels uh, you can get. And the linear range is the span of the analyte concentration over which there is a linear relationship between the analyte and the signal. So for example, if our signal was absorbance, um, the, the higher the analyte concentration, the higher the absorbance, so the higher the signal. And you want this line here this, to be linear, to be a line, to be straight and not a squiggly line. You don't want it going straight and all of a sudden flattening. So uh, if it starts deviating and like all of a sudden like flattening and stuff like that, then you have lost linearity uh, the, the level where it just curves and curves off and stuff. And so uh, then you can only report uh, the concentration from the lowest to the highest concentration where this is linear, where this is uh, straight, and there is a very predictable relationship. Um, and so the linearity is measured and determined by analyzing specimens that span the reportable range. So you're going to have, you're going to want stuff that has very low levels to very high levels in uh, concentration. The hook effect happens when the analyte concentrations exceed the analytical range excessively, like they're way higher than what the analyzer can possibly measure. And so, of course, then there could be antigen excess, although there's supposed to be an antibody excess, um, because you're supposed to always have enough capture and label antibodies. But if there's so much antigen that they're saturated, um, they won't be able to do their sandwich formation and that will cause a decreased signal. So you could have actually really, really, really high levels read low or even sometimes even undetectable because the reaction can't happen. And so uh, what you have to do if you suspect that this should be a, a high or positive or something elevated, then you want to dilute it and rerun it. And the, the name hook effect came, uh, came from the shape of the concentration signal curve when there's this excess antigen. So you, you can see it here. It makes a fish hook effect. So it's going up, up, up. This is nice and linear here. And then here it loses linearity and then push, and drops off here. So again, any samples that exceed the linear range should be always diluted and retested. Uh, and then your heterophile antibodies, uh, these are circulating antibodies against animal immunoglobulins and they can cause significant interference in immunoassays. They will occur in patients that have been given mouse monoclonal antibodies for therapeutic reasons or who have been exposed to mice. The next method is high performance liquid chromatography. So high performance liquid chromatography is commonly used to detect small molecules. It is the most widely used method to detect a catecholamines, which is uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine, and uh, their metabolites, which is HMA and VMA, and plasma and urine. The analytes of interest then are separated from the plasma and urine. They're run over a column and separated by physical characteristics, and it all depends on the type of column that you use. 
Um, and this is used to detect neuroblastoma, pheochromocytoma, and carcinoid tumors. So neuroblastoma is diagnosed by the detection of high levels of plasma epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Pheochromocytoma is a rare tumor associated with hypertension, and it is diagnosed by detecting elevated levels of plasma metanephrines, the breakdown, those breakdown products of uh, epinephrine and uh, norepinephrine and stuff. And your carcinoid tumors are serotonin secreting tumors that arise from the small intestines, appendix, or rectum. The next one is immunohistochemistry and immunofluorescence. Um, these test tumor markers are detected directly within solid tissue. So um, these are identified in tissue sections, typically from fine needle aspirate or biopsy samples. So that's what they're doing with the biopsy samples and stuff. The slice of tissue is placed on a glass slide. It's incubated with specific antibodies in solution that will detect the presence of the antigens uh, that you're looking for. So an example would be the use of a tumor marker that is detected by immunohistochemistry would be the identification of estrogen and progesterone receptors in breast cancer. So you would get a breast cancer biopsy that would test for these estrogen and progesterone receptors, uh, and then that will help to take what kind of therapy is going to be used. Uh, the enzyme assays, so these are like kind of like the older way to detect it. Um, so um, the detection of elevated circulating enzymes generally cannot be used to identify a specific tumor or specific site of a tumor. The exception would be pros prostate-specific antigen, PSA, which is found exclusively, again, in diseased and benign prostate glands. Um, before we had immunoassays and oncofetal antigens, though, enzyme detection was widely used. Um, Here's some of the enzymes that were used as tumor markers. So alkaline phosphatase is, can be used for bone, liver, leukemia, and sarcoma. Creatine kinase BB can be used for prostate, small cell, lung, breast, colon, and ovarian cancer. Lactate dehydrogenase was used for liver, lymphomas, and leukemias. And PSA was used, is, is used for prostate. We just, generally the, the enzymes aren't like widely used for this purpose anymore. And so that is the last one. Thank you.